Hello and welcome everybody. I will let um, uh, everybody to keep filtering through, but thank you very much for joining us at our Let's Discuss Nature with Climate Engagement Guide webinar. We're really delighted to see all of you here today. My name's Dr. Nina Siga and I'm the director for the Center for Sustainable Finance at the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. I will take you through agenda for today's uh, webinar, uh, explain how we're going to run the whole thing. But first, let me say that uh, this session will be recorded and we will email the recording around as well as post it on our social media channels so that everybody can see and hear what the engagement guide is all about. We will also have a question, a Q&A session at the end of it, but you're very welcome to keep popping the questions into the chat throughout um, and then we will just uh, collate and choose some of them to uh, answer. What we're going to do today is I will take you through a little introduction to the Centre for Sustainable Finance within CISL and what we do. Then Sarah Taffy will take you through the uh, webinar on uh, through the engagement guide. And then we're going to have a panel discussion on what's currently happening in the area and how can engagement guide be used today. So without further ado, if I tell you a little bit about the University of Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. We are a department within the University of Cambridge, but a slightly funky one in the sense that we do things that most departments do, such as education and research with a slight twist. We teach postgraduates and professionals mostly, and all of our foresight, all of our research is either practitioner driven or is answering particular practically relevant questions in the area of sustainability. But we do some things that are less typical for a university department in the sense that we have our own accelerator within the innovation pillar. But also we have a, a convening arm, which means that, for example, within the Center for Sustainable Finance, we work with over 60 large financial firms across three leadership platforms. These are the Banking Environment Initiative, where we work with banks, the Investment Leaders Group, where we work with investment managers and asset owners, and ClimateWise, which is our insurance platform. Across those, we do fundamentally two things. Number one, drive sustainability into financial decisions. And number two, think through the financial system as a whole and how we can change it in order to finance a more sustainable economy as a whole. And in that second goal, we also work with financial supervisors, financial regulators, uh, central banks and policymakers around the world. We work at the intersection of climate, nature and social issues. And from that perspective, we it, with our leadership groups, as well as with uh, central banks and financial supervisors, we create tools. Uh, we work on uh, co-creating research. If I could have the next slide, please. So if we think about our work today, we've been working on nature and financial materiality of nature for a number of years. And we've taken nature on a journey from why should we be worried about biodiversity loss and land degradation to creating a handbook for how nature related financial risks are material within financial portfolios to thinking through some of the use cases of how financial institutions are seeing that financial materiality coming through but also thinking through actually how do we bring nature engagement together with climate. So thinking through the intersection between climate and nature and helping financial firms create this process in a single integrated fashion. And really that's where the roots for the engagement guide are coming from. And that's where what we're going to be talking for uh, most of today. So at this point in time, if I um, pass the virtual mic to Sarah Taffet, 
who's our nature finance lead for banks and investment managers, asset owners, and she'll take you through our work on the engagement guide. Perfect. Thank you, Nina. Um, awesome. Just want to check that you guys can hear me OK. We can. Up there. OK, perfect. Thank you. Um, so if we begin with the why now of the guide, there are really three motivating factors to that. Firstly, nature is is not in a great state. The Stockholm Resilience Center released their 2023 updates recently, and within that six planetary boundaries are now transgressed, which includes biogeochemical flows, freshwater change, land system change, biosphere integrity, climate change and novel entities. And pressure is increasing on all boundary processes except ozone depletion. And this is up from four in 2015 and two in 2009. The second motivating factor, which is the impact of uh, this loss of nature, is the economic risk and opportunity. The S&P Sustainable One conducted an analysis on the S&P 1200 index and found that 85% of the companies have significant dependence on nature in their direct operations. And this does not include the companies within the value chain outside of the direct operations. On a more optimistic note, however, the World Economic Forum estimates 10.1 trillion US dollars in economic activity and 400 million new jobs in nature protection and restoration. The third motivating factor is the growth in regulations. In uh, December of last year, we saw the signing of the Global Biodiversity Framework, which calls for the effective conservation, management, and restoration of at least 30% of the world's lands, inland waters, coastal areas, and oceans by 2030. Last week, we saw the European Council uh, reach a provisional political agreement on a regulation on nature restoration. So the proposal aims to put measures in place to restore at least 20% of the EU's land and sea areas by 2030 and all ecosystems in need of restoration by 2050. TNFD launched in September at New York Climate Week and has seen uh, over 50,000 downloads since then. SBTN is a collaboration of organizations working together to equip companies as well as cities with the guidance to set science-based targets for all of Earth's systems. Initial guidance is live and full guidance is set to release the start of next year. So this really details the why now of the guide. The guide itself is really focused on empowering the client facing staff of banks and investment managers to support their portfolio clients and investee companies to act on the opportunities, on the risks and on the compliance demands that are associated with both nature and climate. So the target audience, as I've mentioned, is the frontline staff of, of banks and asset managers. Specifically, that's the relationship managers of banks and the portfolio managers and analysts of investment managers. And the rationale behind these roles is because they're really the connection point between the real economy and the financial economy. Relationship managers are the hub to the wider banking services and focus on expanding and retaining existing relationships. Portfolio managers and analysts are investing asset owners, wealth and capital and monitoring and assessing the market to maximize returns. The question then becomes, how can these individuals, the portfolio managers and relationship managers, use action on climate towards action on nature? Financial institutions have begun to mainstream climate related risks and opportunities across their business following the recognition of climate related risks and increased regulation on climate related reporting and disclosures. This includes involving climate change in their engagement with clients and portfolio companies as part of climate strategies that were informed by stress testing efforts, scenario analysis and assessments. assessments. So when conducting climate assessments, corporations and financial institutions both are understanding the immediate impacts of changing temperatures and weather patterns understanding that they cause things like heat waves and droughts, growing intensity of um, weather events and ecosystem disruption due to habitats being impacted by these changing weather patterns. And in doing so, this is demonstrating how climate stability can impact access to nature uh, and natural resources, things like the reliability of water, of air quality, the ability for commodities to grow and the resilience of the ecosystems that those commodities grow within. 
This then demonstrates the business implication for the client or for the portfolio company of a change in climate. Therefore, action on nature is already happening through action on climate, and I will detail this further here in the next slide. So as I've mentioned, climate assessments have become more mainstreamed and they've allowed us to understand how greenhouse gas emissions will alter the stability of the climate. But specifically, these assessments provide a better understanding of how the ecosystem services that are core to a business process may be affected if that climate stability changes. As you can see in the green box here, these are the ecosystem uh, services or dependencies. And this includes things like water security and quality, air quality and local climate, um, goods provisions or the ability for goods to grow from the earth, um, habitat intactness or the quality of the habitat for those goods to grow within, and then the hazard regulation, uh, which would be the natural resilience of an area to natural disasters. However, this is not painting a full picture of the business's relationship with nature. It's giving an immediate it's giving, sorry, a first view of the relationship with nature, but in order to have a full understanding uh, of a corporation or um, a business's process, uh, its relationship with nature, we need to explore the other four nature loss drivers, as you can see in the blue boxes here below. So that includes land and sea use change. So changes in the use or management of land by humans. This may lead to a change in the quality or extent of natural habitat, which has knock on effects for ecosystem services. Deforestation would be a good example here. Overexploitation of natural resources, which is using natural resources or harvesting species from the wild at rates faster than they can recover. Pollution is the introduction of materials into the environment that harm nature that can be within the air, water and or land. And in invasive species are species uh, whose introduction by humans threatens biodiversity. And very interestingly, um, IPEBS just put a, a report a month ago that found the economic cost of invasive alien species exceeded $423 billion in 2019. So we've now detailed what is the business case. We've explored how climate and nature are connected in, in hopefully a simple way. The question then becomes, how do we then um, utilize engagement to help with the nature loss crisis? So in this guidebook, engagement is not narrowly defined around a reputational challenge, but rather is about the core business of the portfolio client or investee company and specifically how it is impacted by or contributes to nature loss. So engagement as a concept is therefore better conceived of as engagement on material commercial issues in this case, the dual nature and climate crisis that touches all of the ways the financier and the financed company interact. For banks, this includes exploring new financial products, exploring the refinancing of existing products to support the client in their nature positive journey, and really creating a point of collaboration and trust between the bank and the portfolio client in their trans transition into the nature positive economy. <clears throat> For investment managers, this includes utilizing share ownership through in, uh, intentional activism and leveraging voting rights to steer the investee company uh, towards nature protection and restoration. And this also includes fulfilling the asset owner's requirement on how capital is allocated. For both banks and investment managers, this includes the various material risks and opportunities emerging, which may be driven by regulatory or political changes or more broadly emerging research, uh, research and approaches within their sector of the portfolio client or investee company. So we've now detailed the business case for action, the connection of climate and nature and what engagement means, which is how this is presented in the guide. So before the reader really lands here, which is the heart of the guide, the engagement wheel, they will have read through those other three uh, sections. So as you can see here, this is really the how do we create action around climate and nature. And this engagement wheel presents a five phase approach to integrate nature into existing engagements on climate. For each phase, the guide provides uh, details of the context and target outcomes of that phase with helpful resources, guiding questions and ideas to support the portfolio manager or the relationship manager uh, with the research and preparation efforts. Set the scene in the top right hand corner here is focused on opening the dialogue by expanding climate related conversations to include nature 
and establishing uh, yourself and the financial institution as a close partner in your client or investee's nature positive journey. The black text that you're seeing here are phase activities within that wider phase. Assess focuses on the assessment of your client or investment's current position on nature and ambitions for the future. Design is not about creating, but supporting the client or investment to design a clear transition plan, highlighting the financial implications for nature and climate related impacts. Support focuses on the structuring of solutions, financing or otherwise that support the nature positive transition of your client or investment. And the review stage is focused on monitoring progress, supporting your portfolio client and investee company, and furthering the nature positive agenda within your organization. <clears throat> it's important to note that this model does, sorry, I'm just gonna have a sip of water for a second. <clears throat> sorry, I'm just <clears throat> coming over a head cold. <clears throat> sorry, hopefully you can hear me okay now. <clears throat> so it's important to note this model does not need to start at Cephasine, nor does it need to follow each stage in this order that I've presented. Because nature is showing up in various stages of the engagement cycle, we've tried to design it in a way that supports that. So the suggestion from us is to use this uh, relative to where, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, where your client is in their nature positive journey. So to give you an, an idea of what this looks like in example, um, an example of what this looks like in practice, sorry, within the assess phase, 2.2 um, is the phase activity and it's around assessing your portfolio client or investee company's current position on nature and ambition for the future. So how can you best prepare? Start interacting with your client or investment on uh, their strategy towards nature. And this can include asking these types of questions. So has your company considered how the decline in biodiversity might impact the future of business? Does your company have targets related to nature protection and restoration? Do you have a biodiversity strategy? And if not, what might it take to get that happening? <clears throat> Sorry, just jumped a slide there. Um, and then resources to help support doing that, which you can see here. So what does this mean for portfolio managers and relationship managers? This uh, We've, we've designed it for immediate use. We've done it with the understanding that you don't need to be an expert in nature to help support. <clears throat> and in doing so, you can really help build strength and trust with your investee. What does this mean for banks and investment managers? Again, it's building trust. It's about um, reconciling emerging material portfolio risks and ultimately future-proofing portfolios to ensure resilience and longevity. And with that, I will wrap up the presentation. Apologies that my speaking got a bit stumbled there with this um, cold that's hanging on, but I'm going to pass it back over to Nina for the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Sarah will be back with us to answer any question in the Q&A right at the very end. But at this point in time, let me introduce our wonderful panel. We have three distinguished panelists. We've got Claire Alborn, who is an engagement specialist at Rubico, joining us. We've got uh, Christoph Baumann, who's a deputy head strategy division um, and an envoy for sustainable finance at the State Secretariat for International Finance in Switzerland, as well as Oliver Withers, who is head of biodiversity at Standard Charters. Thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you very much for having this conversation with us. So my first question is a, a rather um, evident one. So when you look at the let's discuss nature with climate engagement guide, which parts, what bits of it do you find particularly insightful, particularly useful? And so if we do just around and if I start with Claire. Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. And thank you very much for having me. Um, I think part of well coming from the engagement and the investment side um and having started at some point as well on the biodiversity engagements as well as on the climate engagements which came before that i think the key part about the guide that adds value to to me also when i sympathize with other peers that are coming into this debate is the achievability it it brings through so really the lens of 
using what is already there as an entry point, the whole discussion about uh, climate change and making sure that you're building uh, on top of that. And I think one, if really narrowing it down to one particular part of the guide, um, for me, the the second, or not sure if it's a second part, but the assess section of this has really, I, th I think, put forward quite clear questions of how everyone could just uh, really plug out some of these questions of like how uh, are your operations impacted by certain climate change scenarios which are interlinked with biodiversity or how are your biodiversity practices uh, following into your climate strategy and which is just very easily to take out and apply to any of the engagement uh, strategies that are already in place. Thanks Claire. Krista? Thanks so much for having me on this panel. So I would start with that I think when discussing it with uh, many ambitious financial institutions, they're looking to the, the leading uh, research facilities and leading universities for, for guidance. And usually when you look at the policy papers that come out of there, there's a huge gap from these policy papers to the day-to-day -day job of a financial institution advisor, a client advisor. And it's for a, a typical ESG manager, a CSR manager at these financial institutions, it's hard to bridge this gap themselves. So it's absolutely, um, I'm delighted to have now a, a guide from a university, from a leading university that's really directly applicable to these client advisors. And that's so timely on this uh, nature topic. What I also love is this process orientation that it really goes through the different relationship stages a client advisor has with their clients, starting from the setting the scene, um, then assessing the client situation, designing a plan, and then supporting the client with a financial plan or with, um, with other activities. And in the end to review it again. I think that's exactly the way client advisors look at their relationship as well. And lastly, I absolutely love the framing. So putting it not just as another topic to look at, but combining it with clients. So with a process, with a topic they're already very much engaged with, with their clients uh, to combine it with climate is, is uh, I think very important given the interconnectedness of the, both of the topics. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, Christopher. And it's just one more way to start filtering nature into exactly that conversation. Oliver? Yeah, th thanks very much for having me. I mean, just to build off both Christoph and Claire's points there, I think that one really great piece that comes out of the whole whole report is this idea that you're not starting from scratch. You've already started on this journey. You just didn't realize it. Uh, and I think that that makes it a lot easier for people to realize they're actually in the journey and don't have to start it. Um, so I think that that's a critical tone throughout the, the paper. I think also a really, really important thing from my perspective is is the underpinning of of opportunities throughout the paper right is that we often talk about the risk and and trying to quantify the risk but we actually we need action um and i think that that's the really critical part of that paper as well is that it, it underpinned through all of the sections is this ultimately we get to action uh and i think for for the bankers uh for for nature for our clients that's what everyone is actually looking for. So I, I, I think it's a really good guidance uh, and, a, and to Claire's point, a relatively soft entry point into what is a potentially complex topic. And I think the, the thinking through this was as well is that effectively it's combating a little bit of the narrative that nature is so complicated and so complex and we'll just get to it at some point in the near future once we've dealt with climate, which is precisely not what we want everybody to do. So it's just bringing people in, showing what they're already doing in this space. So let me just kind of dig a little bit deeper on what you are already doing and how you're using this. If I go to Claire and um, ask her about how are you giving us maybe some examples of how that nature engagement is already happening today and how it can be actioned today. Yeah, happy to share a little. And there's also an example of exactly that in, in the report for those that haven't looked at it yet. Um, I think at Rubico, we have the privilege to have had resources to work on, especially the nature aspect of uh, this debate where I'm working on for quite a long time. So it started off with, I think, many debates around palm oil uh, already uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, and this has really built up on that expertise uh, on an ongoing basis so that 
I think now three years ago, we launched a dedicated engagement program uh, to speak to our investee companies about the topic of deforestation. And Sarah had mentioned it briefly before, deforestation is, and the overall the land use change, especially in the agricultural sector, is a huge contributor to carbon emissions. So the carbon stored in trees and in soil as it's being tilted or cut down uh, for to make space for agriculture is releasing an enormous amount of carbon dioxide, which is contributing to climate change. So from and even if we started off by talk, looking at it from these companies are destroying part of very critical ecosystems. Uh, at the basis of it, it was from the beginning also a very strong climate discussion. Um, and so now we've spoken to some, I think we've had in scope around 12 companies in the agricultural sector uh, about um, coming from or working around some of the key forest risk commodities. So that includes uh, from beef and soy to uh, timber, cacao and natural rubber. Um, and we've asked or we've been talking to them about exactly these challenges that they've had in addressing some of these key emissions and in getting to really stop or prove that there is no deforestation or land conversion in their supply chains. So to frame it off, we've set very clear ambitions, as, as we often like to do. We want companies to not have any deforestation, very clear policies, uh, show very strong traceability systems and monitoring systems. Um, but also what Oliver mentioned before and what I think the guide puts out nicely is this whole space of opportunity and i think also in the global on, in the global discussion it's coming out a lot more this topic about restoration and not just becoming nature neutral uh, but really contributing to this narrative of nature positivity so that was also a big part of these uh, discussions that we've had um and i think so overall throughout these past three years, if I may reflect a bit on them, there's been an extreme shift, I think, also in the awareness of, of these companies that we've been talking to uh, about how they go about the nature and the natural capital that they are relying on so much. And this has moved from, for instance, barely having a deforestation policy to now having very clear commitments to, by 2025, not have any deforestation in the supply chain, a lot driven, of course, also by regulation, uh, or from in the beginning when we asked, uh, do you have, have you conducted a biodiversity impact assessment, uh, getting the response, from, no, what, what is this and why do you want this, to actually now piloting the TNFD. So there's been an incredible uh, shift in mentality, and I think a very big part of that has come from exactly this nexus between biodiversity and climate, where, for instance, the Science Space Targets Initiative included uh, in their flags of the forest, land, agriculture guidance, uh, very clear requirements. If you want to have your climate strategy for certain sectors, especially the agricultural sectors, approved by our initiative, you have to showcase um, no conversion uh, and, and certain really land and biodiversity related initiatives. And so just to very briefly round this off and kind of go back onto this opportunity space, I think one very positive example that we highlight in the report as well is our dialogue with the cacao sector, which wasn't necessarily escalated. I think it was a very harmonious sector because the sector from the beginning realized how critical it is that they act on protecting the land that they're sourcing from and also empower the smallholders that they're sourcing from. So for those that are not familiar with the supply chain, it's coming a lot from Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, where there's many uh, relatively poor farming families. Um, so it's really about creating these opportunities and it's shifted from really avoiding the worst to so no deforestation, creating traceability to now uh, having set first targets about restoration, really trying to scale this. We're not there yet. And there's still many, um, many things to watch out for. Perhaps we can get back to that as a future in a future question. But um, I think it really showcased how even an economic incentive can be created through that and really support also the livelihoods of the small farmers um, on the ground. So I think that's a really beautiful example of how from a problem solving Combining it with climate, it can really turn into an opportunity.
And it also quite nicely demonstrates the, the, the positive spiral that you can have because you, you do go, uh, you start kind of relatively basic and then you cycle through into more interesting um, incentives potentially. And just you were talking about uh, science-based targets, you were talking about TNFD, and that brings me really neatly onto my question to Christoph. Um, can you talk us through a little bit what you're seeing happening in the policy space that is enabling action on nature and how that's integrated with climate? Absolutely, very happy to do so. And I, I'll mention the current initiatives, the current dynamics, but also where I think uh, the road should um, go from here. I think there are very exciting dynamics uh, going on. So obviously mentioned already TNFD, the launch uh, this autumn. It's now absolutely crucial that we get the first disclosures going from corporates um, on a voluntary basis. I do believe that over time you'll see more and more um, regulators uh, picking up on it as well. Um, I would hope that ISSB rather soon um, decides on uh, building nature standards uh, very closely based on the TNFT, not that we kind of uh, create a parallel world there. I think tremendous work has been done on TNFT. So that's certainly something that we will be pushing for in the various um, international fora we, uh, we are part of. And the other thing from a disclosure perspective, um, we should really push towards is having kind of the net zero data public utility equivalent in nature to really have a public utility of um, free and accessible data on the nature side for corporates to build their transition plans on um, over time. We might still be a bit on the early side on that, but it's important to really build this up early on as well. And I do think that there's a shakeup similar to Paris with the uh, Kunmin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework with um, Goal D and Target 14. So al aligning the financial flows with the, with the biodiversity goals similar to 2.1C in the Paris Agreement. And that really shakes up. So I think one of the key next steps will be to find um, a common understanding, at least from a methodological perspective, of what it does it mean to be aligned. So similar to, for instance, what PACTA does with the climate alignment tests that Switzerland and many other countries have been running um, um, each couple of years with the market, I do think we should go into a world where we do something similar like that also on the nature side to get an understanding where is the, where is the financial market moving on in terms of the alignment. Now, the other side of the coin, which is very interrelated, is the macro potential risks that uh, are stemming from uh, biodiversity. I think the NGFS, the Network for Green Financial System, has done tremendous tremendous work over the last year or two and will increase its work on this front as well. I think there's an emerging consensus that it can have macro potential risks. And the more, the more this becomes a consensus, the more this nature topic will be part of the Financial Stability Board. And then it's at the attention of regulators and central bankers, and that will be absolute key. And I'm um, quite optimistic also with the G20 presidencies ahead of us in Brazil and South Africa, that nature, both the risk and the, uh, the alignment side, will have uh, quite some, some time in, on the agenda to discuss. So I'm very hopeful on that side. Um, I do believe that a company or a financial institution that is building climate transition plans and more and more are doing so, um, we shouldn't end up in a world where there's a transition plan for climate and a separate one in in independent of it on nature. So we do we should look for um, any initiative that's working on transition plans. So the TPT in, in the UK or um, hopefully the ISSB will provide further guidance on transition plans. Um, the science-based targets initiative, there we have the science-based targets network. So we should find ways to marry these um, two topics together uh, so that there's one comprehensive environmental transition plan. That would be um, my goal for. Now with Switzerland, we've been early supporters on this topic. We, we've um, helped develop ONCO, one of the alignment tool and risk tools. We've been a supporter of TNFT. And we now really try to also switch the narrative, um, as Oliver mentioned, but also Claire before, to the opportunity side. So we don't want to wait until there's a global consensus on it's a huge risk. We need to address it. We see already a business opportunity, and we want to really have the frame of conditions there that the financial institutions who are active on this front um, hopefully also have a competitive advantage. So from this angle, we had uh, uh, recently a nature finance roundtable and we'll have uh, with the members of the roundtable very close engagement of the next um, months to find ways to really position ourselves. And also always with the back um, in the background, the idea when we get the opportunity sites, when we get them convinced that it's an opportunity, 
it's clear that we can only achieve this opportunity if we if we um, do credible actions. So it it kind of like pulls um, um, with it all the work on nature alignment and on risk mitigation. And I'm very very excited about that. Thanks so much. Thanks, Christoph. And kind of talking about what good looks like is also, I think, quite important. Actually, uh, this again brings me super neatly to the question, uh, to my question for Oliver, uh, because Oliver has been working on uh, creating nature positive assets. And can you talk us through, you know, what those are and what the opportunities for integrating nature and climate looks like? Yeah, certainly, Nina. I mean, listen, I think, uh, and you guys do this excellently at the, the beginning of the report, actually, um, we don't have a standardized definition for nature positive yet. There are various initiatives underway to, to try and give us a standardized definition. But crudely, as it stands today, um, the way to look at it is, one, are there transactions where we can actually see a clear delivery of biodiversity or nature outcomes, right? Um, so clearly net positive uh, overall. I think, and again, all credit to, to the report for highlighting the second component of this, which is nature positive also incorporates reducing drivers of biodiversity loss. And I think that sometimes in the market that can be uh, the the least sexy uh, of the two options. And, you know, I have spent an inordinate amount of my time trying to work on the, the sexy, innovative stuff that generates, you know, net positive biodiversity and nature outcomes. And I can tell you they are... Uh, they are very uh, time consuming um, and just picking up on Claire's point, you know, specifically on highlighting agric and then you drill down and you get into palm oil, biodiversity and nature are context specific, right? Whereas climate and carbon is very often just seen as a commoditized thing, right? Um, so immediately you've got those two worlds almost colliding to a certain extent. And, you know, today our most monetizable opportunity uh, to bring these two themes together is is still carbon, right? Now, needless to say, this has been a, a particularly tough year uh, for carbon markets. Um, and there are obviously a number of challenges with that market. However, practically, that is still today where we see an ability as a bank and a financial institution to really deploy money at scale into nature conservation. We've also seen in the development of those carbon markets, right, uh, the slow recognition of it's not just about carbon credits, it's about the quality of those carbon credits, right? So slowly we have introduced this, this lens attached to biodiversity or nature, but also very importantly, social considerations, right? So that, in many circumstances, let's be blunt, is actually making doing carbon projects more challenging because there are more complexities, there's more dynamic movement around this topic of nature and social that now needs to be factored in. But as it stands today, carbon really is a huge, huge opportunity for us uh, when we look at nature-based solutions uh, to really get money into the field and deliver impact. And that really, Nina, builds on the uh, a line you used around best practice, right? We, we, we really need to be supporting those those carbon nature based solution projects that adhere to best practice right because the the harsh reality is is that a plantation of a single monoculture species like eucalyptus trees that is not helping nature right let's be very clear about that um so there is a massive opportunity for us to really ramp up the quality of of our carbon markets i also think you know coming out of the the global biodiversity framework when we look at for example uh, our targets around restoring 30% protecting 30% critically within that protecting 30% is this recognition of other effective uh, area-based conservation measures, right? So OECMs. And I think that we're really only starting to scratch the surface around how uh, nature-based carbon projects can actually represent OECMs if managed according to best practices. And very importantly, that those projects can in fact contribute to us and sovereigns achieving the 30 by 30 targets and goals. Just want to pick up on kind of some of the comments, you know, Christoph made. Another thing that we are waiting for as a sector, quite frankly, is uh, the global biodiversity framework was only adopted in December last year, right? It's going to take time 
for the implications of that to trickle down the system from a policy perspective, right? And not everyone is as efficient, shall we say, as Switzerland at getting going on this. So, you know, for us, particularly in some of the markets that we operate, this is going to be a long journey, right? And so we also need to acknowledge that as we see that policy uh, get uh, introduced to get alignment with the global biodiversity framework, that will create opportunities in and of itself, right? And I think that financial institutions should be very, very alive uh, to that. Um, as much as, you know, the carbon stuff is really exciting uh, and can get money moving today, there is obviously this emerging topic of biodiversity or nature credits, right? And And this really points to an important point for me, which is, just because a carbon credit is not being generated doesn't mean that there is no climate mitigation or adaptation value. It, you know, it just might mean that it's not feasible to run a carbon project on that landscape or that intervention, right? So, uh, for example, we, we worked previously on some outcomes-based financing mechanisms, one, one being a rhino bond where uh, we are are seeing money go into rhino conservation. Rhino conservation means conserving an entire ecosystem. That ecosystem is a carbon sink, right? We're not trying to sell carbon credits off the back of that, but there is a huge climate benefit, right? So I think critically, we also need to realize that the climate benefit is not always measured by carbon, right? Uh, and I think that we've seen huge success. If you look at, for example, some of the debt swaps have that have been done, none of them are measuring carbon output or trying to sell carbon off the back of them. But interventions to conserve the ocean, we know are good for climate. Um, so I think this nature credit or biodiversity credit piece coming through is gonna offer some real opportunities to get that overlap again. Um, and then the third piece, which you know, I, I'm particularly interested in is adaptation. Right. And again, we've 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 heard a lot of talk about nature based solutions for adaptation. We still haven't really cracked being able to monetize that uh, properly, but there are pilots underway around sort of resilience credits, etc. So I think that 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 is going to offer a significant opportunity going forward. That adaptation piece also circles back very nicely to the risk component. Right. Um, nature has a role to play in de-risking assets. Uh, and that's why you're seeing the insurance sector really leading on a number of these initiatives. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity emerging there. But I just want to highlight again, all of that stuff is great and really, really important. And it's important that we're restoring landscapes and doing these sexy, innovative deals. But let's not forget the fundamentals, which is we've got a real opportunity to reduce drivers of biodiversity loss. Right. And when we look at having to bend the curve of biodiversity loss, that is a critical component of that journey. Now, again, going back to my opening comments, one of the beauties of the report is this idea that, hey, guys, you're not starting from scratch. You're already on this journey. This is another really fantastic thing uh, when we look at reducing drivers of biodiversity loss. If we pick on, for example, sustainability linked loans or bonds, there have been numerous transactions across the market where we see KPIs that are actually reducing drivers of biodiversity loss. Again, it highlights this, this over, overarching narrative. Guys, you've already been working on this. You're already doing opportunities that are moving the dial on biodiversity, right? We're not starting from scratch. We just need to scale up and amplify. Um, so like I say, for me, that that's that kind of nature positive uh, asset class, there is the sexy innovative stuff where we're trying to generate you know, net positive results at the end of the day, but let's not forget we have a huge role to play in reducing drivers of biodiversity loss, and that is something that our clients ultimately usually have control over. That's a really good way to actually lead me to one more question to all of you, which we're going to answer in one minute intervals before we open up to... Uh, the questions from the audience. So you have right now a captive audience ahead of you, uh, in front of you, uh, of corporates and financiers and uh, a couple of policymakers. So if you're sending them home today, what is it that you want them to do today to drive us onto this journey? Claire. One minute. Okay, I'll be fast. Um, 
I think really taking from the guide the opportunity that has been stressed now a couple of times of exploring where can nature be introduced into the dialogues of the initiatives and conversations that are already happening. And this can be in just introducing one question in the discussion with an investee company about their biodiversity footprint and how this is linking to their overall climate strategy. Because uh, as Oliver mentioned before, there's a lot of carbon also stored in these biodiversity uh rich ecosystems for instance um or whether it is about rethinking how an investor is voting on a certain shareholder proposal around biodiversity which can be very small triggers which can have an immense impact especially in these sectors that are often forgotten in the climate uh or not forgotten but uh, less looked at in the climate debates as often that uh, in especially in the food and agri sector, a lot of their emissions are in the scope three bucket uh, and can be very much related to these biodiversity loss drivers. I'll pass it on Fantastic. to someone else. <laughs> Fantastic. So what are you doing on nature? Adding one more question in into the engagement. Christoph. Very shortly, um, report along TNFT. Those that have already done it uh, have found it easier than, than they thought, given that it looks daunting from start. Um, so please re do so. Please try it out. doesn't need to be perfect from the start. I think the expectation is it's really a learning curve there as well. It should get better from year to year. Uh, do so with a double materiality. Thanks. And remember how less than perfect the first climate reports were for TCFD. And I, I have a couple of those in my back catalogue and they were not <laughs> beautiful at all. Very qualitative, but it was a start. And some still are. <laughs> Spot on you are. Um, Oliver. I mean, listen, from, from my perspective, it's it's all about the end game, which is action. Um, and so for me, it's always a question of how do we get to action? We need understanding. Um, you know, everyone is on a different journey and and starting at a different baseline. Uh, before you even get to understanding, you need to you need awareness. Um, so for some people on this call, this is potentially your first uh, step into the world of nature and biodiversity, um, you know, really delve into the awareness of what is a, a broad topic, but a, a really fascinating topic and a critical topic for our economies and for our livelihoods. Um, and then, you know, really look for those deep dives into understanding and, you know, Nina, just to applaud you guys for the work that you are doing, because that is really driving a lot of the awareness and understanding, which ultimately enables action. Um, but let's keep focused on the end goal, which is action. So listen to the webinars and read the report is what Oliver was trying to tell you all. Right now, if I bring Sarah back on uh, the camera and I believe we've got our first question, which is a question that everybody asks the second we talk about climate or nature or anything like that. Please, can you tell us a little more about nature related data and how important it is to the methods and any particular good or bad examples? I suspect Christoph is going to ride in with the net zero public data utility answer, potentially, maybe. I think I'm not qualified to answer that. I'm policymaker. We are very shallow. So I'll leave that to the practitioners. <laughs> All right, Oliver Clare. I'm happy to 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 give my view on this. I mean, listen, I, I the data is not not great and it's not perfect, right? Let's admit that from the start. But we can't let perfect be the enemy of good or progress here. Uh, there's enough data for you to start this journey. Um, also, I think one of the kind of critical messages across the sector is focus on materiality. Right. Um, let's not try and boil the ocean. Uh, if you are looking for perfect data and you think you're going to do this across your whole portfolio and get a perfect response, um, I've got bad news for you. That's not coming anytime soon. And probably you are going to wrap yourself up in all sorts of contorted uh, kind of descriptions and designs trying to make sense of it all. Um, but there is enough data that's out there for you to start looking at certain sectors, certain geographies, uh, and starting to get a feel for where your materiality is. Once you've got a feel for where that materiality is, it can lead you down into kind of some some deeper rabbit holes where you start finding perhaps uh, some of the data that you're looking for. I also think it's worth 
really highlighting that, you know, yes, there might be data challenges today. It doesn't compare to the data challenges three years or five years or 10 years ago. So this space is rapidly, rapidly evolving. Uh, and at some point, I think we'll actually, the discussion will be there's too much data. We need consolidation. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet, um, but I think that's the direction of travel. And perhaps also if I can jump in and come a bit from how can we create a bit more data, I think also the investment sector there can play a very critical role and it really should be an incentive to go out to speak to the companies and share, ask them to publish very clear and meaningful KPIs or metrics such as on the one hand, I think what we're looking a lot at is their exposure to certain, pro, uh, to certain commodities, for instance, especially as it comes to these I think the, e the easier example often the deforestation or the forest risk related commodities uh, or the extent to which they're recycling uh, certain products or trying to reduce the intensity uh, or the pressure on these ecosystems. So there's definitely metrics out there already. There's just not one very clear framework to uh, encompass them all. Um, and I think also looking at the work that we've been doing uh, we've taken it step by step and have tried to, for instance, focus on one commodity first on there where there is a lot of data already. So I think the journey for us started with palm oil. Now it's going into the other uh, different commodities um, and really looking again at this exposure, the materiality uh, and how they are managing this. So here also a lot of the certifications come in and play a very important role. So this external verification of certain data points, whether that is an FSC certification or whether it is the percentage of verified deforestation free uh, commodity sourced. Um, there's definitely ways to increase this um, and perhaps to round off. I think there's also an important role from the finance sector to speak to uh, our data providers um, and encourage them to or share what we're looking for to integrate this more and more. And actually, kind of maybe if I add on to this, so if you're just starting on this journey, and you want to do a strategic review of your portfolio and where their dependencies lie. If you don't have location specific data, you can use Encore. You can use Encore to help you understand where the biggest problems in your portfolio might be, even without location specific, as long as you have a subsector and a sectoral split. And from then on, you can start digging deeper. If you do have location data, then you're way ahead of everybody else. You can go and look at WWF Biodiversity Risk Filter Tool, because that will enable you to have a slightly more advanced approach on this. But there are methodologies out there. There is data out there that can be used. And there are certainly things that can be done today when you are back at your desk in trying to understand where those dependencies lie and kind of target yourself into it. We had another question on the correlation between just transition and biodiversity and how an engagement can include both considerations. Who wants to jump on that? Perhaps I can give it a start, especially and again, coming back to my engagements around deforestation, and I know they're coming from a very particular angle. Um, but if I go back to the cacao example that I was mentioning, some of these supply chains are extremely uh, dependent on uh, smallholders, and it's very important that the social considerations are taken into account. One very quick and easy answer for some of these commodities could be from the investor angle or from the top uh, to just move out of certain risk, uh, high risk areas. Uh, whereas this is a very, of course, an, potentially in some sectors, an easier answer. It also has quite a lot of implications for the people that are staying behind. So I think there's a very big and important responsibility of companies to make sure that they're not just shifting away and turning a blind eye on the problem, but actually lifting up and working collaboratively with peers, but also with governments to solve this issue. So for instance, in the cacao supply chain, we've seen that, especially in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, there's been a lot of dialogue with the governments to create uh, more traceability, to create a national traceability system, um, as well as, of course, there's been the ongoing discussion around uh, living incomes for these farmers and how can we incentivize uh, and also just make sure that the 
farmers on the ground are maintained and are not incentivized to actually deforest. So I think there's a very important aspect of this just transition that comes very clearly into, into this sector as well. If I may jump in here as well, um, both both on climate and biodiversity, when you talk about the just transitions, it's important to note we are currently not on a just trajectory. And because we now transition, we might leave this just trajectory and end up in an unjust world. No. If we continue this path um, of climate change, of uh, global warming, if we continue this path of lo with loss of biodiversity, usually those that are most affected are those uh, are the po uh, poorest countries and the poorest within a country. And so, it, it, we will actively by transitioning, we will also contribute heavily uh, towards um, the equality or um, fight mitigating some of the in inequality issues that we are currently. Um, on the path of realizing. Obviously, this also means that when transitioning, there's many stakeholders to include as well, many opportunities to generate as well to maximize the positive impact on, on this front. There are two, we have one minute uh, left and there are two questions on um, increasing the bankability or the investability of nature positive assets, as well as the strategies and mechanisms that can be employed to scale up the use of blended finance. So this is a both massive questions, but if anybody has a 30 second answer, and given that Oliver's been quiet, I'm going to go to him for a 30 second answer on that. Yeah, so listen, I mean, I think that on the blended finance side, um, we are seeing an emergence of a number of providers looking at this. I think that, you know, this can come in the form of guarantees, political risk insurance, concessional capital. Um, this historically has been the domain, certainly from a biodiversity and nature perspective of really the large conservation NGOs. I think that highlighting this, this nexus of social climate and nature is actually now effectively unlocking more capital, right? Because actually a number of the interventions that we're looking at as Blair kind of articulated in her example, there are social benefits, their climate benefits and their nature benefits, right? And so I think that uh, what we're seeing is, is slowly a tearing down of those silos, right? And actually a blending of the blended finance that's available, uh, which is increasing the scale and also allowing us to look at solutions that are at a landscape level instead of just very focused on a particular topic. Uh, and I think that that's really powerful. So I do think the blended finance land landscape is evolving rapidly. I think that some of the reformation you're seeing within some of the, the multilateral development banks is, is going to feed into this as well. Um, I mean, listen, let, let's be clear. Uh, wars uh, globally do not help public coffers, uh, you know, so that also has a negative impact on the amount of blended finance that's available. But I do think that this landscape is improving quite dramatically. Um, in terms of, of kind of more products and how do we scale these products up, um, I think I just want to reiterate this point that, you know, carbon by itself is commoditized globally. Uh, again, I'll pick on Claire's example. The solutions are context specific. We've got to get our hands dirty and we've got to get into the field because that's where the solutions are needed and that's how we should be designing the solutions. So it, I'm afraid it doesn't lend itself to faster replication or scaling, but I think this, this you know, African saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So I think we need to demonstrate some patience as a sector that not necessarily these deals are going to be done very quickly, but the impact will will last much longer. And on exactly that point of collaboration, it's on my turn to say thank you very much to all of our wonderful panelists, to Christoph, to Claire and to Oliver for coming to discuss the guide with us. To all of the rest of you, uh, we have also just published a piece of work on how to drive uh, finance towards the climate uh, nature nexus in emerging markets and developing economies, imaginatively titled Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. So go have a look at that. It's got lots on solutions. We will be continuing to work at the intersection of climate and nature. We'll be doing nature use cases within the insurance sector. And we will also be doing a lot more work on how to finance uh, nature within the kind of the banking and investment sector. 
Thank you very much for listening to us. Uh, do send us questions if you've got any questions. Um, and the email address is going to go into the chat. It's csf at cisl.cam.ac.uk. And thank you for joining us at our webinar.